What is up, everybody? We are one more month into the year of 2024, and finally, the movie season feels like it has actually started. January and February were just complete duds, and uh, now I have 13 films to talk about that I saw in the month of March. So, we're back on track, baby. I have reviewed most of these films in length on my channel, so as I go through them, I'll put a little card up here if you want to see my more in-depth thoughts on them, but overall here... A pretty interesting group of movies. There's some really good ones. There's some mediocre ones. There's a couple of bad ones, but a really diverse group of movies, which is what I love when you get a month like this, where there's just so much for so many different movie fans. Coming in at number 13, the worst film that I saw in March. And to be honest, the only movie of these 13 that I would say is a bad movie, which is a pretty good bad in average for March. And that is Blumhouse's latest blunder in Imaginary. Now, Blumhouse is uh, such a complicated subject because inevitably almost every single year they'll deliver one of the best horror films of the year and they'll deliver a couple of the worst horror films of the year. And if there's anything that I could say to give advice to a company that doesn't need my advice because they make money hand over fist every single time, it's just can we get the quality control? under wraps here like i wish blumhouse was one of those names where every single time it came out you would be like "Ooh, this is going to be something cool and interesting but you just don't know you never know what you're going to get out of blumhouse and here lately their track record over the last year or so has been rough to say the least and this is one of the worst examples of it since the last worst example which was just two months ago in night swim so imaginary it's kind of taking the megan approach very clearly trying to catch some lightning in a bottle again with this concept of kind of manipulating and corrupting the object of a child uh, as far as like the last one was the toy. This one is the imaginary friend. So you got this character Chauncey Bear and there's this dysfunctional family element going on. And this movie is just boring as hell. It's just so templated. It's so generic. It is so cheap and low budget that you watch it. And you really just don't see any passion here. You don't see anything that seems like an actual genuine good idea. It was just something that they knew they could churn out. They could get just enough people to go see it where they could turn a profit. And that's the biggest issue with Blumhouse. And that's what's starting to become kind of their their reputation with a lot of horror fans. It's they're just the, the turn and burn company. You know, let's put out something for the lowest amount of money that we can commit to it. We'll make a profit, whether it's absolute garbage or it's really good. And then we'll make the next one. And it just sucks because, like I said, you get things like the black phone, you know, you'll get things like some of the better insidious movies and you know, the really good stuff coming out of Blumhouse. And then you'll get something like this that just makes you go, why <laughs> who greenlit this? So, yeah, I didn't enjoy this one whatsoever. There was potential with the concept. There was potential with some of the, the things that they were going for. Um, you know, I didn't think it was the worst thing ever, but I watched it and it's just it's just lifeless. It's just an empty horror experience to make a quick buck. Coming in at number 12 was the last film that I watched for this list. I just watched it last night because I was basically dragging my ass at checking this out the entire month and squeezed it in last minute. And I was surprised genuinely how low it landed on this list. And that is Spaceman. This is the, the latest Adam Sandler Netflix movie. And look, I will take 10 of these before I take another one of like the, the goofy Happy Madison comedies on Netflix, even if they don't completely work for me. Because I like seeing Adam Sandler do some of the serious roles. I like seeing him do things like this and hustle and uncut gems. And I want to see more of that. I think that he's at that stage in his career where he needs to focus more on that kind of stuff. And give us a comedy, you know, every every couple of years. One that's got a lot of effort and heart behind it. Hopefully, this rumored Happy Gilmore 2 will be exactly that. But nonetheless, Spaceman is a movie that's it's directed by one of the people who were a director on Chernobyl, which I still have not seen, but... Uh, it's a very serious, slow burn character study drama where you have this astronaut who is alone on this mission around Jupiter. He's like almost uh, two thirds of a year into this trip and not even halfway done. And he's in the middle of this tumultuous relationship with his wife who is pregnant. And essentially the movie is about his isolation and his guilt and his regret regarding his relationship and it kind of manifests in this spider that he finds in his vessel that is voiced by Paul Dano and it's like a extraterrestrial spider that has psychic powers and so basically the whole movie is him floating around this vessel looking extremely depressed 
while this spider talks to him about his thoughts and his memories regarding his wife. And so, I mean, the movie's got very deliberate themes. The movie is, is shot really well. It's edited very well. It's professionally made. But my God, is it boring? Holy shit. Like the initial teaser that they released that was just basically Adam Sandler walking around on this, this woodland planet. I was like, ooh, what is this? I'm intrigued. And then as soon as they actually released a full trailer for it, which showed the spider and showed more about what the movie was about, I was like, oh, I'm not so intrigued. So that's part of the reason why it took so long to watch it. And some of the initial reviews and reactions didn't really excite me enough to put that more in my uh, my priority list. But yeah, I watched this one. And look, Sandler gives a good performance. And as I said, like technically it's well made, but it, this thing is just so dull and it's so slow and it feels like one of those things where it's a decent enough idea for like a short, but it's dragged out to almost two hours and you're like, I get it. He has guilt about his relationship and there's childhood trauma. Like, I, I, fuck, I get it. I get it. I get it. Can we just move a little faster, please? Holy shit. So I could see some people liking this much more than I did. Uh, I mean, like it, it's better made than a number of movies that I have above it in this list, but maybe even more so than Imaginary. Spaceman is the movie of these 13 that I would enjoy rewatching the least and I would recommend to the least amount of people because it just ooh, it tried my patience. Coming in at number 11 is Godzilla X Kong, The New Empire. And I decided not to review this one because look, I just feel like it's all of my reviews of these kaiju monsterverse movies might as well be the same review. Like I, I don't get into the kaiju stuff. As a matter of fact, last year when I reviewed Godzilla minus one, I had said in that one, which is the, uh, the God's Honest Truth, that's the only kaiju movie I've ever seen in my life that I genuinely liked. The only one. So these movies aren't for me. They all are very much capturing the same thing. They're going for the same target audience. And some people really love it. This movie made a lot of money. And that's fine. It's just not for me. Giant CG monster punching other giant CG monster. I just get nothing out of that. You know, maybe as a kid, I might have as an adult. It just does nothing for me. It's a totally empty experience. The humans are always garbage and dispensable in these movies. They're tolerable in this one. Dan Stevens and Brian Tyree Henry are, are fun enough to watch in spots. But the, the human storyline is, is, is dispensable. Nobody gives a fuck. It's just about what what's Kong doing? What's Godzilla doing? When are they going to fight or what bigger thing are they going to team up and fight? And is the action, you know, CGI spectacle done well? Sure, it, it, it's fine. I just don't care. Like, the only element of this movie that I kind of enjoyed was the Diddy Kong character, which I don't know who the fuck the character is, if he's actually like a, you know, a known creature in this universe. I just called him Diddy Kong. But uh, yeah, it, it, he's the only part that I kind of enjoyed. It just, it's just an empty experience for me. So I don't get anything out of this. I, I never look forward to another one of these movies. If they were going to make one that would somewhat pique my interest, it would need them to just basically focus entirely on the monsters and do kind of like a Dawn of the Planet of the Apes type thing where you have subtitles or whatever and just have Kong doing his thing and then Godzilla gets pulled into it and don't have any humans whatsoever. Like to me, that would be an interesting enough experiment to see if these creatures can survive on their own and tell a story without humans just giving all the exposition throughout the entire movie. I'd be somewhat intrigued to see that. I don't know if it'd be better or worse, but that's about it. But God, Godzilla X Kong, it, it's exactly what it's advertised to be. For some people, that's a great thing. For me, it wasn't. Coming in at number 10 is a movie called Dog Man. And this is one that I actually saw last September at Fantastic Fest. Uh, it's playing in, I believe, select theaters. I don't even think it's playing locally near me. And this is Luke Besson's newest film. And I'm not going to go completely into detail with it. You can check out my Fantastic Fest uh, ranking that I'll put up here for the full story. But the night that we saw this is far more entertaining in and of itself than the movie was. Uh, and, and part of it being even just this high is probably because of that. Uh, essentially, there's these secret screenings that they do at Fantastic Fest. You never know what you're going to get until you sit down. There's always rumors. There's always whispers in the crowd of what it's going to be. And uh, so we, we were all expecting this to be Exorcist the Believer or um, Saw X. And then we sit down and they're like, hey, you're going to see Dog Man. And the whole theater is just dead quiet with everybody just kind of looking around, like waiting for like Ashton Kutcher to come in and say we're all punked. <laughs> like it, everybody thought it was a joke. Even like 10 minutes into the movie, I think we were waiting for the the aha moment that they were fucking with us. But nonetheless, this is a movie where it, it's. 
it's interesting because the the chapters that like bookend the movie are a movie that I really want to see where you have this guy that has been raised with dogs and has some kind of cognitive ability to communicate with dogs. And so he's essentially turned himself into this street level mobster that uses dogs as his muscle and he just runs his block. And, you know, he's somebody like the Godfather where you can come and ask for favors and stuff like that's how the movie starts. And that's kind of how the movie culminates. But the vast majority of the film in the middle is literally like a weird version of Forrest Gump, where he's retelling his life story from his childhood with an abusive father that locked him up in the kennels with the dogs and going through his first love and going through his obsession with drag queen shows and all these different things. And it's such a weird fucking movie. And as I said, if you had focused on the dog gangster stuff and did a whole movie, and, and that's where Luke Besson's style really shows too, some of his Luke Besson action, I think that's actually like a kooky enough idea that that could have really been something cool. But the majority of this movie is not that whatsoever. So it's very odd. It's very memorable. It's very unique. It, it's it's something that like I kind of recommend for people to check out just because it's such a strange experience that I kind of want to hear people's takes on it and have that conversation. But I can't think of anybody specifically that would like love this movie. <laughs> you know, so it's an odd one. It's coming in here at number 10. Coming in at number nine, one of the bigger surprises this month, namely that it's not easily number 13. And that is Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey Two, a movie that I had no plans to check out, but due to some recent events, I decided to give it a shot. Not going to reiterate any of that here. I'll put a card up here for a video that will detail everything. But nonetheless, I was not a fan, to put it extremely lightly, of the first film. I wasn't a fan of the concept of the idea. And when I actually saw the film and gave it a chance, it was significantly worse than what I would have ever expected it to be. And so I was more or less completely checked out of this entire, you know, we'll call it a Pooniverse since that's what they're calling it now. Uh, but I decided to give this one a shot and I was genuinely surprised how much better it was. Uh, I think that the creature designs and the kills were much better. I think that the lead performance and some of the character work and the story in and of itself was much better, namely because there actually was a story and character work. Uh, so, yeah, big step up from the first one. Still couldn't bring myself to give it a positive review. I still think there was more issues than things that were done well, but I at least appreciate that we're on an upward trajectory. And hopefully, as we continue to go throughout this Pooniverse, <laughs> I still can't take that name 100% seriously, but as we go through this Pooniverse, uh, I'm at least hopeful that you know Blood and Honey 3 or maybe the Peter Pan or the Pinocchio movie will actually be uh, so some good schlocky horror fun and we'll continue to get better as we go along. So uh, this is one that I, I had a pretty good time with it. You know, there, there's a lot of issues here with it still taking itself too seriously. I thought it was it was way too dark as far as lighting, uh, which is something that I've I've heard be a varied experience dependent on your theater. But there was quite a bit that I I had trouble seeing visually. Uh, there was a big exposition dump in the middle of the film that I thought just brought the movie to a screeching halt. And it was a shame that we couldn't find a way to do uh, to get that information to the audience in a more organic way or by showing us rather than just having a person just wax away for a solid three to five minutes about all the details that we need for the third act. But when you go to a schlocky horror film like this, what's most important, the kills, the villains, uh, the blood, the gore. And I think they did a solid enough job. You know, this is something that belongs in that category with like Friday the 13th, part five, a new beginning, or, you know, maybe like uh, nightmare on Elm street four and five. And some of the, the, the sillier installments in these slasher franchises that a lot of fans of those films and those franchises still have a good bit of fun with despite its flaws. So if you're a schlocky horror fan, I think this one delivers a much better experience than the first one, but we're still not quite at the level where I would recommend th these movies to anybody who is outside of that very niche slasher audience. Coming in at number eight, we have Kung Fu Panda 4, and I took my youngest daughter to go see this, and look, I really enjoy the first two Kung Fu Panda films. I thought the third one was solid. This one is clearly the worst of the four while still being decent. This is not like an offensive animated film. Uh, when you're a parent like me, especially you're a parent who doesn't really get into animated films as much anymore, there's basically two experiences for the most part, with the exception of the, the rarities like Spider-Verse or something where it's like this next level really good movie. 
there's basically two experiences you have as a parent. There's either misery or tolerable. <laughs> and so this fits into the tolerable category. And it just it, it's a shame that it kind of feels like it's it's spinning its wheels narratively. We're going over some of the same stuff to a degree. We're having some of the same villains and uh, and Poe is kind of going over some of the same character work. So it, it's still got charm. The voice acting is still pretty decent in here, but I just didn't really get much out of it. It was a fun enough 90 minutes to spend with my daughter. I don't plan on ever rewatching it. Number seven is Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, easily the biggest disappointment this month. I'm somebody who, I, you know, I, of course, I love the original, and uh, I really liked Ghostbusters Afterlife, which seems to be a bit of a divisive movie, but I genuinely thought that that was a great sequel. That's easily the second best Ghostbusters film to me, and I was excited to see what they were going to do here. Now that we have gone through the very deliberately nostalgic story that was afterlife and paying respect to Harold Ramis and bringing back Gozer and all of that. Some people would argue was too much. I, I enjoyed what they did with that one. I was excited to see what they were going to do to push this into new territory now that we don't have to rely on nostalgia. And what do they do? They, they rely on nostalgia and the new stuff kind of gets stifled by the seven or eight plot lines that they have going on in this movie. There's just way too much there's way too many storylines, there's way too many characters, and the movie is constantly at battle with itself on whether it wants to push this char these characters and this Ghostbusters property into new territory or if we want to stick to the past and have Slimer segments and have the little mini Marshmallow Men and things and give a lot of screen time to some of the older cast, whether or not they really feel like they belong there or not. Nothing but love to them, but you know, some of them feel like they're just here as glorified cameos. And, uh, and it just ended up being kind of an empty experience for me. It was fun enough. My kids enjoyed it. I wouldn't hate rewatching this one. And maybe if I rewatched it, I'd be a little easier on it. But of the seven or eight different storylines that they're going for, there was very clearly like two or three that were the key ones that you could have just focused on those and told a movie just focusing on them. And it would have been a really solid Ghostbusters sequel and a really solid progression from where we were at in Afterlife. So this is unfortunately the first of a, a, a bunch of blockbusters that I really hope are not going to give a similar experience to the ones that we had last year where they all just kind of felt middle of the road. This, this feels very much like that to me, where I wanted to love it. I, I should have loved it, but I just walked out not loving it. Now we're at number six, and the rest of this video are some seriously interesting movies. So I recommend checking out all of these just, if nothing else, to have some really unique experiences in the theaters. Number six is going to be Love Lies Bleeding, a new A24 film. And this is one that got a lot of buzz whenever they released the trailer a few months back. It was certainly on my radar, but I dragged ass getting out to see this one. It was released the weekend that I was extremely busy. And so I actually did a double feature of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2, and then followed it up with Love Lies Bleeding, which was a really weird one-two punch. And essentially what this movie is, is a white trash crime thriller gangster flick lesbian love story fantasy psychedelic trip you have Kristen stewart who is the daughter of ed harris and she runs this little rinky dink gym and then you have i think katie o'brien is her name who is this bodybuilder chick that comes in and they very quickly have this romance that kicks off and it gets hot i'm gonna tell you that right now all right i'm not gonna beat around the bush about it <laughs> But essentially, they fall in love. Kristen Stewart has some ties to some gangster shit that, you know, Ed Harris is her father and he's a, a crime lord in the area. Katie um, uh, O'Brien is trying to get to this bodybuilding championship. And so she gets into some steroids that Kristen Stewart provides her and people end up getting killed through road ra or roid rage and... <laughs> This is a hard fucking movie to describe. <laughs> it sounds interesting, though, doesn't it? A bunch of wild shit happens. A lot of motherfuckers die. And it, it, it's a really interesting movie that's hard to take your eyes off of it. I was gripped the entire time. It has a really good uh, visual style to it, a good soundtrack. Uh, it, it, it's the type of movie that I should love and I almost loved but they lost me in like the last six minutes of the movie. There's this psychedelic, fantastical nature to the movie where, you know, throughout the movies, there's just tiny little sprinkles of it whenever they're trying to visualize like the roid rage that uh, Katie Bryan's character has. 
And at the end, it just goes full batshit bonkers with it. And I understand perfectly what they're trying to convey, uh, you know, metaphorically and literally there. But to me, it was just way too out of left field. Uh, like as soon as something happens visually, I was like, oh, why did you do that? What the fuck? That no, no. And so literally this movie probably would have been number three for me until that last five or six minutes and then it just went way too weird and way too strange and ended on a note where I just felt kind of unsatisfied it ends on this kind of ambiguous note and it ends with some questions not being answered and not I don't know I don't want to go too far with describing it but just yeah it, it's a movie that's worth watching I could see people absolutely loving this thing for how weird and wild and unique that it is but if they had just stayed the course with the tone and the approach that they had for the first 98% of the film, I would have loved this. But the way that it ends, just, oh, it really turned me off. And so, I don't know, maybe I'll rewatch it and I'll like it more. I'll appreciate it more. But, uh, damn, it was almost there. Number five is Late Night with the Devil. And this is a movie that the conversation online just changed on a fucking dime. And it was wild to watch. This is something that has been just hailed and hyped ever since South by Southwest last year, where it premiered. And here recently, when we we're getting close to the actual theatrical release, there was so many people talking up how wonderful this was and how amazing this was and what a standout horror independent film it was. And I saw it. I reviewed it. And then like a day later, they let it slip that a couple of the images in the movie were created by AI. And holy shit, did Twitter do a fucking heel turn on this? And suddenly this was the punching bag of the month of March. Now, my thoughts on that look like, yes, th there's only like four images in the movie like you add up all of them together it's maybe like 10 seconds or more of screen time in the entire film is it worth making a gigantic stink over that maybe like I, I understand that it's about setting a precedent it's about stopping it right where it starts so that we send a message of no tolerance to Hollywood so that suddenly we don't get 15 seconds of screen time and then a full 45 seconds of screen time and then five minutes of screen time and then 20 minutes of screen time. Like I get it. You got to start it or you got to stop it right at the starting line to send a message. Cool. I'm all about all of that. Do I think it's fair to completely overshadow everything else that's done well in the movie and make everything else in this, in this movie just for naught because of a couple of still images? Not quite. So that's kind of where I land on all of that. But nonetheless, the movie itself is a really interesting and unique indie horror picture where you have David Dismalchian giving a really good performance of this late night talk show in the 70s. And he's eating shit when it comes to ratings. And so he just goes for broke one night and brings on a bunch of crazy motherfuckers onto his show for this Halloween special. And there's demon possession and, you know, uh, conjuring the devil and stuff like that. And things go horribly wrong. So it's essentially a found footage film where you get to watch the last episode of this show as it aired in the 70s. And they splice in some of the behind the scenes stuff between commercials. And there's some backstory and some uh, some epilogue stuff that happens. And so it's an interesting story that I think is definitely worth checking out. Did it fully come together for me? No, uh, I feel like some of the special effects, the practical stuff was pretty good when it got into more of the CGI effects. It totally lost me. It looked more silly than crazy or tense or scary. Also, the way that the movie decided to wrap up didn't fully work for me. I watched this movie twice. It did work better on the second viewing, but still, I feel like a lot of your questions regarding the meat of what is going on throughout most of the movie go unanswered, and then you're just given a bunch of direct answers to something that you, you never really were asking too much about in the end. And, you know, it brings the character arc full circle, and it gives a little bit of context to what is going on, but... This wasn't the most satisfying ending to me. So I really did like this. I would recommend it to all horror fans to check out. It'll be on Shutter at some point if you can't find it in theaters, but go support it in theaters if you want to. So I liked it, just like with Love Lies Bleeding. It, it could have been much higher, but just didn't quite stick the landing for me. Number four is going to be Immaculate, a movie that uh, I pretty much said is a where you're either going to love it or absolutely hate it in the last two to three minutes. Uh, a lot of movies here in the last three are just like the 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 ending is <laughs> the big make or break segment. Uh, Immaculate is Sydney Sweeney, where she is playing this uh, this newly devout nun. She goes off to this convent and. Uh, essentially, as soon as she gets there, things start to seem a little bit off 
And then she is found to be pregnant, even though she has never had relations with a man. So now she's kind of being treated as the new Virgin Mary, while things continue to look and appear uh, significantly more off in this convent. And where a lot of people's common criticism of this movie is that the first two acts of it are very generic and very run of the mill and been there, done that. I found their approach to what they were doing to actually be very refreshing. So I'm the oddball in this one where I really enjoyed the first two acts of the film more than I enjoyed the third act. Uh, are, narratively, are they going over a lot of the same ground that we've seen religious thrillers and horrors go over before? Yes, but the tone and the approach and the way that they decide to explore all of that, to me, just it felt refreshing because of how ground that it was. And that it didn't uh, it didn't, it didn't seem to lean into the cliches specifically that I am tired of seeing. Maybe the cliches they leaned into are things that other people are more tired of seeing than me. Then you get to the third act and there's a bit of a tonal shift. There's a bit of a pacing change and the direction that it goes, uh, like I said, will either make or break it for you. To me, the third act of the film needed to breathe more. I wanted to see more of what was happening here. It felt like that was the quickest chapter of this movie and it needed to be about the same length as the other ones that were much more deliberately paced and there's a one-shot sequence that ends this film it's like two or three minutes long that is technically very impressive performance wise completely solidifies Sydney Sweeney as an actress to keep my eye on uh, I haven't really seen much from her aside from Madam Webb this movie sold me on her narratively what they do in the ending though didn't completely work for me. I understand 100% what they're going for there and why it shouldn't, but it just, it, it, it did kind of leave a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. So uh, this is a movie that I would recommend to certain people, but at the same time, I would walk in with caution that um, th this is something you're either going to be extremely sold and they're just going to get you with a clincher at the very end, or it's going to dismantle your entire experience. And and be a dice roll which person you are number three is a movie called one percent warrior and this is another film that i saw last september at fantastic fest that just got its little vod release and when i saw it it was called one percenter and honestly i think that was a better title but nonetheless one percent warrior is essentially this uh, martial arts film of which i'm typically not a big fan if you watch the rankings of fantastic fest the last two years typically i call those uncle sean picks where I'm there for all the horror stuff. And then Uncle Sean's like, let's go check out this Chinese, you know, mysticism, martial arts movie. And I'm like, OK, fine. And then uh, he ends up liking them more than I do. That's that's a genre of films that he grew up with. And I did not. But this is by far the one that I've enjoyed the most among the last two years that I've been to this festival, where you have this guy who creates this this new fighting style. And he uh, he makes this movie and has a bit of a flash of stardom and then wants to make a film where he kind of like brings action and martial arts movie making to the next level with this very unique martial arts style that he himself has created. But then it does a time jump and he's a burnout. Basically he's a has been, nobody cares. And so he commissions this cameraman to go with him and go scout locations on this Island and when he gets there, there's a bunch of gangsters and crime lords and drug dealers in this abandoned warehouse building. And he decides, you know, if I fuck up all of these criminals and film it, I can essentially make a proof of concept for my movie. And so it's like a martial arts version of Die Hard, where one man versus a crime syndicate in this building with really good fight choreography and some really impressive camera work, too. There's some really cool drone shots in this movie. And that's cool enough, but there's some really nice twists and turns in there, too. So this was a really cool movie. This is one of my favorites of last year's Fantastic Fest. And as far as foreign martial arts films, this one might be my favorite that I've seen. And I have not seen very many. So take that with a boulder of salt. But uh, I really dug this one. So if you like martial arts flicks or even if you you're kind of hesitant, but the concept sounds cool. Check this one out because it was a standout for me. Coming in at number two, we've got Roadhouse, the remake of the 80s cult classic, the ultimate dad movie. And this is a movie that I was pretty sure was going to be my thing. I'm very easily uh, pleased and entertained when it comes to old school, violent action films. Uh, I mean, you have movies like The Beekeeper from January that was my favorite that month, and I enjoyed that quite a bit. So Roadhouse is the type of movie that I enjoy and doesn't have to deliver 
next level experiences to put a smile on my face. But I think it was a very well done remake. You know, I've never been a fanatic of the original, but I've always liked it. It was one of my dad's favorites, so I've seen it a number of times. And I think this movie had its finger on the pulse of what a remake needed to be. It was still self-aware. It was very aware of what the appeal of the original was. And it kind of stuck with that tone. This is a goofy movie that you're not supposed to take very serious. That is just a, a bone breaking fight movie where you get over the top character trading blows with other over the top character and just make the fight sequences cool and give us some good one liners. And you got a solid experience here. Is it as iconic or as memorable as the original? I don't think so, because it doesn't lean into the bouncer culture as much. There's not as many memorable one liners. There's not as many memorable little moments as there is in the 80s movie. But I still think it was a really fun action flick. Jake Gyllenhaal was great. Conor McGregor has been the blunt end of a lot of jokes, especially on TikTok and everything. But I think he delivered what the movie needed. You know, and I'm not saying that he's got much capability beyond what he does in this movie as an actor, but for what he can offer, I think this movie utilized that well, and I think it was entertaining. Uh, a lot of the fight sequences were shot pretty good. You know, a, a little bit of uh, CGI speed up and things here and there that didn't quite work for me. But as far as how they shot the action and getting you right in the middle of it all, I think it was done well. And I just had a good time with this one. So I get it if it's not your cup of tea. But for me, this absolutely is my cup of tea. I want more movies like this. And so... Even though it's not my number one, this is the movie on this list I could see myself rewatching the most. But coming in at number one, we got Dune Part 2, which I honestly forgot that it was even a March film because I was able to see a press screening in February. It was one of the few press screens I was able to attend. And so this feels like forever ago to me. But nonetheless, this was a March release and it's easily number one. I mean, I wasn't on the train of like this being this life changing experience. This seems to be one of those movies that is just going to be uh, film Twitter's favorite thing ever until 2025. And I understand a lot of reasons for that. You know, there are some people that I know I'm friends with that have gone to the theater like nine, 10 times to see this. Uh, no, that's I'm, I'm not quite on that level. I thought it was very good. I thought it was a good follow up. Um, I thought the action was a step up. I liked a lot of the character stuff that they did visually sound effect wise, sound design wise score, like all technically it, it's an immaculately made movie. I was, a little bit let down in the fact that this is not a conclusion, though, uh, or at least it wasn't enough of a satisfying conclusion to stop here until we get the third chapter. I did not realize that they were going to be doing Dune Messiah, and this was very clearly a part two of a trilogy. I thought this was uh, two halves of a movie. So when I walked in to see this and I started to realize the movie was going to wrap up, I was like, wait a minute, there's so many questions. We're really going to stop here. And so I feel, I really wish I would have walked into this with the knowledge that this was going to be a middle chapter. And I wonder how much that would have changed my experience. But yeah, it ended on a note where it was it, there was a lot of things that were done satisfying to wrap certain things up. But there was still so much just left in the balance that I was a bit bummed, uh, especially since there's no telling when the hell we're going to get this third movie. I mean, Denis Villeneuve has already been on record saying he's got like four other projects that he's looking at to do before this one. They haven't even really completed a script on what this third one is going to be. It's technically not even greenlit, even though it's a sure thing to be greenlit by the studio. So, I mean, it could be fucking four or five years before we see this thing. And it was an agonizing enough wait waiting from the first part to this one, which was just a couple of years. So that bummed me out a little bit. I did feel like the pacing of the film dragged down a little bit in the middle. You know, it's very action centric in the front and it's very action centric in the end. And then there was a lot of stuff in the middle that slowed it down a bit. So, you know, I, I wasn't on the train of this being the greatest thing that I've ever seen. But I did really enjoy it, and I did find it to be the best movie this month. And I really do look forward to rewatching it. Maybe on one rewatch, suddenly I'll see the light and I'll want to watch it eight, nine more times in a month. But as of now... I like the movie. It's my number one. But let's, let's calm down a little bit. Well, that's it for this one, guys. If you enjoyed that, please click over here for all of my 2024 new release reviews. I'm also going to put a playlist up here of all of the month wrap up videos that I've done so far, of which I've done two now. And please check those out if you want to like, share, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss everything in the future. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.